It's now almost the end of day three, and thanks to some heroic work by Phil and the diggers, the Brock has got one last I mean, surprise really for us. I mean, we, we thought that we had possibly a hint of an entrance mm -hmm. coming through these sure. big stones. So we thought, well, if this is an entrance, it ought to go right the way through the wall. Right. So what we did was we opened up this trench here. Right, but this is your outer wall here, isn't it, Carrying Precisely. So this is not the main entrance. Right. What it is, is an internal entrance coming through from the inside of the, of the building mm -hmm. into here. Now the question is, where does it go? So we, we think yeah. that maybe, or we thought that maybe it would go oh, this wow. way. Yes. We dug there. Fantastic. And look mm -hmm. what we got, a set of steps. Yeah, these are your steps that the, you would have walked up into the, the higher galleries. So just walking up here. That they're basically taking you up to first floor level, so you're sort of walking around between the walls up at the first floor of the Brock. These stairs would have led you into the very heart of the Brock. A warm, dry living area protected from the extremes of weather by a sophisticated architectural design. The Brock would have towered over this terrain its mighty double walls defying the frequently harsh, hostile conditions of the western coast of Scotland. And yet no one can say for sure why it was built. But that hasn't stopped our team coming up with their own theories for this enigmatic building. Wherever you went in that community, whoever you were, you'd always see that tower. It's, always, it's, it's, a, sort of, it's a pillar of strength. That, uh, it's, it's, it's a sanctuary. It's a sanctuary. It's, it's, it's something which makes you feel secure. What you're saying with the Brock is we've got the community here, we've got this area of land is ours. We can defend ourselves. We can defend our wives and children. You come raiding into us, we'll put our wives and children in here and we'll come out with our swords, spears, whatever, and take you on. Basically, I think what they are are sort of very, very flashy monumental farmhouses where the uh, sort of local social elite are likely to have lived. It's a machine. The building works as a controlled atmosphere. And the more height you have, the more you can build in and get the temperature regulated keep it hot all the time, or in the summer, if there is a summer here, you can cool it <laughs> off as well. I think the jury's out on what they're used for. I think, I, I think it changes throughout Scotland. You can't just have one picture of a brock. Do you have any idea that the brock and all the other things that are up here would have been so complex? I had no idea at all. It's a very complicated site. It's a beautifully <laughs> made thing, isn't it? It brock? is, yeah. Well, a huge amount of labour, yeah. looks to Pity it's not still here, really. It would have been a fantastic focal point for Applecross. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. When we first started to unpick this huge pile of stones in the pouring rain, the thought that we might actually be seeing structures there by day three seemed optimistic, to say the least. But thanks to some epic hard work from our diggers in, frankly, atrocious conditions, we can now see things that are clearly corridors and stairs and massive walls, the key elements of a broch, one of the largest and most complex examples of prehistoric architecture in Britain. understand it, these barges helped to transport all kinds of Roman goods heading through to Britain. But I'm not sure exactly how the supply system worked. What we have over there, what we've been looking at, is part of the, the river truck part of that journey, if you like. Utilitarian boats carrying bulk cargoes down the Rhine of all kinds. Some of which were things like wine and so on later on that came over to Britain. And you had a, at least two different types of boat in, involved in that. The, the, the low, flat, vessels like we've got out there, and then big, much rounder vessels. And I know Victor's been working on a couple of drawings here. A 35 metre long barge like ours would never make it across the North Sea, and the goods would be transferred to a seagoing ship like this. This particular ship, Blackfriars One, was found in the River Thames in the 1960s. It's possible, in fact, that the goods were transferred from boat to ship here at Utrecht. The name Utrecht means trajectum, which means the crossing point. People assume sometimes it just means crossing from one side of the river to the other, but it can also mean crossing from the river system into the sea. It's a great finish to the dig and their project in this area. Oh, now you can see, really see its boat it's shape, isn't it? 
but given the importance of this barge, I have to ask them, is there any chance the rest of the boat will ever be excavated? If the groundwater level lowers and we notice that you know, there's degeneration of the wood, I think you call time team. You think so, there's the possibility that one day we might get the phone call? You might. Come and dig the whole yeah. boat. I think, yeah, we have, to do, we have to reschedule time team and do it in four days, I think. <laughs> we might just do that for you. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Wouldn't it be great if we could just pull this entire barge out of the ground right now? Well, with the magic of graphics, we can do just that. This way, we can see the full scale of this unique river barge, which measured just under 5 metres wide and something like 35 metres long. This is the missing link, as Damien calls it, the earliest example of a Rhine river barge. It was constructed, most likely, for the Roman army, using a mix of local and Mediterranean shipbuilding techniques. Built around 85 AD, this barge seems to have had a working life of 15 years, before it was deliberately sunk around 100 AD to stop the River Rhine eroding the frontier road, a desperate measure by the Roman engineers fighting a constant battle against the forces of nature. And now there's just enough time to share the news with the people who did all the hard work. Ladies and gentlemen, the dendro date for our barge is, give or take five years, 85 AD, which makes it the earliest Roman barge ever discovered on the northern frontier. In the absence of any dating evidence in the bottom of this three-metre defensive ditch, the feeling is that the two phases of ramparts we've unearthed both probably date to the second century too. Snap. <laughs> there you are. That's the crop mark at Stracathro. This is the crop mark at Drumlanrig. The little triangular area and the continuation that Stuart was talking about is the equivalent of, shall we say, that area there. Here is the annex, just the same shape, although four times bigger than Drumlanrig, and here is the corner of the fort and its side to which it's attached at Stracathro. Exact parallel. Stracathco is classified as a definite first century site, and Gordon now thinks that this could be proof of the same early occupation at Drumlanrig. Is what you're saying that the best evidence for first century activity is this annex? That's is that right. what you're saying? That, uh, in terms of structure, Yes, at the moment. So you found something really good and you didn't even know. <laughs> oh, great! <laughs> That's why I was so excited. <laughs> Geophys's completed survey has revealed lots more buried archaeology for the experts to think about. And it can now be studied against our 3D model of the site. But most importantly, what the Geophys plot has given us is a much clearer idea about the layout of the second century fort. We can put on the, um, the ramparts and the ditches. Now, we know about those, obviously, and um, Phil's dug the trench right the way through it, so we've got a pretty good idea of that. Now, we've got the headquarters building, which Kerry and the others have been opening the trenches up across, so we know that building's there, and it's pretty clear from the geophysics. Now, that's the nodal point, if you like, and from this, everything else um, pans off. So we can put in the other buildings according to the geophysics, that's very good, isn't it? Yeah. You can really see those in the geophysics. So there's the barracks, probably for the infantry. There's our headquarters building. I put granaries here and a commandant's house, but to be honest, we really can't be certain about exactly where those were on this fort. More barracks here, perhaps for a cavalry contingent, if there was one here. We end up, therefore, with roughly 480 infantry and possibly 120 cavalry at the end. Standard Roman unit. It's difficult to see because the stone walls have been robbed away, but as I understand it, Phil's located the massive back wall of the building and inside it, evidence of a room with a wooden partition wall and the trace of what might be a dais or raised floor. It's likely that this was the Chapel of the Standards, the room at the heart of the headquarters where they kept items such as a bronze draco and the other valuables. And as we found lots of evidence of burning within this huge building, it seems likely that the Roman soldiers set fire to the headquarters just as they did to the wooden buildings, before leaving Western Scotland for the last time and withdrawing to Hadrian's Wall around 160 AD. <laughs> Hello, my name's John Gator. 
Time Team is fan-funded by Patreon. This vital support helps us to make new episodes. Joining Patreon gives you access to exclusive interviews, 3D models and masterclasses, plus lots more.